so before I start, I just want to show you what happens when you work too much on MacRuby. You get a little one in that. <laughs> I was also told that you guys should be moved by looking at a baby, and whatever I will present, you will actually enjoy. <laughs> so no ponies, but you get a, a nice baby girl. All right, so MacRuby. Um, well, before we talk about MacRuby, I will introduce myself for those who don't know me. So my name is Matt Emanetti. And uh, during the day, I work on video games. I'm a video game developer. And at night, I hack on different projects. Um, and I work on Mac Ruby and other Ruby projects. Which is kind of interesting because most people do the other way. They work on Ruby during the day and work on, or play video games during the night. But that's the way I live. Um, I'm part of the Mac Ruby team. Um, we're a bunch of people. Not everybody works at Apple. Uh, but the lead, uh, Laurent Sansonetti, actually works for Apple full time and he's part of the, the OS team. I'm also the author of the O'Reilly Mac Review book, which is not yet published, but the book is open license and uh, you can actually read it online. You can read the drafts and you can make comments and you can help me with the content. Um, actually, I believe Mac Ruby is currently the open source book with the most comments. So I really want to thank everybody who's been helping me with my bad English grammar and suggesting different things. Um, so that's about, that's about it for me. So let's talk about MacRuby because that's probably why you're here. So to understand MacRuby, you need to understand that MacRuby is an implementation of the Ruby language uh, on top of the Objective-C Objective -C runtime. Um, the goal is to target Ruby 1.9. And uh, the idea is that uh, Apple wanted to have their own Ruby implementation to target the Cocoa uh, environment. So MacRuby is 1.9 compatible when you can run C extensions. If you look at Ruby 1.9, Ruby 1.9 looks a bit like that. Um, you have a parser, and you have the VM yard. Uh, there's a runtime and the GC, and then you have uh, built-in classes and standard libraries. In MacRuby, uh, we kept the same parser. Uh, we replace YAR by uh, a mix I'm going to talk about quickly uh, later on. Then uh, we use the Objective-C runtime uh, with the, the Objective-C uh, garbage collector. We kept the Ruby 1.9 standard library and we have built-in classes and we, we use core foundation um, on top of that. So if you compare both of them, you can see things change a little bit, but it's not too, too far away. Um, on the bottom left, you can see instead of Yard, we're using LLVM and what we call Rockstar. And that allows us to do a lot of things. So LLVM gives us the opportunity to do just-in-time compilation. So for those who are not, who are not really familiar with how that works, here's a small uh, explanation. Um, we transform the abstract syntax tree into an LLVM intermediate representation. So once we have that, we can optimize it, and we can compile it to machine code, and we can execute it. The advantage of doing that is we get a really good performance for algorithmic operations. <coughs> but on top of the just-in-time compilation, what you can do is you can do ahead-of-time compilation. And now that's, that gets interesting. Because what you can do is before you run your code, you can compile your code. Um, and you can use a command line, or you can use the Xcode, and uh, you can compile the code before you run it. And what happens is at the end of the, uh, the process, you get uh, an object file that you can run directly. Um, the main, two main advantages for doing that is um, first, the boot time will be uh, faster because you don't need to do the, the JIT. Uh, and the other aspect of it is people cannot look at your source code. Two things that are pretty important when you write desktop application because you don't want people to go and look at the source code and modify uh, or just even understand what you're doing in some cases. Another big aspect of MacRuby is that there's no global interpreter lock. Um, what that means concretely is that's how we run um, MacRuby. Each thread runs inside its own VM, and um, the VMs are uh, lockless and re -entrant. and the core uh, will take care of uh, the potential locks that need to happen. Each thread are native POSIX threads, and the GC itself runs in its own thread. Uh, the GC is a multi-threaded generational GC, which means that it's not a stop the wall. So when the GC runs, you, your program doesn't stop. None of your threads will stop. Um, another advantage that you're getting for, from using the Objective-C runtime on top of the GC is the native access to Cocoa. 
And I'm going to show you some examples of that. But that's really the real reason why Apple invested and still invests in MacRuby is so you can write Cocoa applications in Ruby. You also have access directly to Objective-C and C, so you can call uh, functions and method directly. So now that I show that, I want to explain when you do not want to use MacRuby. Because first, MacRuby is not for everybody. Um, and the first obvious one is if you don't have a Mac, do not use MacRuby. <laughs> um, so people always ask me, oh, can I compile MacRuby on Linux? Um, <laughs> Right now, you cannot. There's no reason why somebody can afford it. Everything is open source. You can do it. But I don't think any of us working on Mac would be will do it. Uh, and I really doubt Apple would be interested in doing that. The other aspect is, well, if you do Linux OS, hosting, obviously, you're not going to use Mac Ruby, um, because it's not going to run on your Linux box. So don't try. The other thing is, if you don't want to learn something new. Um, for me, MacRuby uh, really was a way of hacking on project and app run, and it still is. Uh, and if you're interested in doing that, I think MacRuby is a great project to look into. If you want to do apps, to, to create apps and make money, that's also a good reason to use it. But I think the main challenge for people is to learn something new, because you, you have to understand and learn a bit more about Cocoa and understanding how desktop applications work and how to use new new concept, and it's basically not Rails, it's something different using Ruby. So that was a quick presentation of Mac Ruby. I want now to talk about what's new since last time. Last year, uh, Laurent did a, a presentation, and he showed where we were at, and we actually changed a lot of things. I mean, we made a lot of progress since last year, and I want to go a bit in depth and show you some of the details, and I will try to not be boring. So the first thing is that Apple gave its seal of approval to MacRuby, and now it is officially stable for development for Cocoa. So that's a, that's a big that's a big one for us. A lot of people have already been working on apps. Um, Hampton Captain sent me this, this screenshot of an app he's working on right now. It's a, a DNA sequencing. Um, Hampton Captain is the guy who's behind Hamel and a lot of cool projects. Um, he wrote a DNA sequencing app uh, and is still working on it and. Uh, his husband is a, a biotech guy, and basically this app lets you connect to different databases around the world and get and do some DNA sequencing. Uh, there's the People Open project, uh, there's a bunch of projects out there. I know that also Integrum already pushed their first app to the Mac Apple Store. So uh, there's a lot of cool stuff going on. Um, MacRuby is really stable now at this point, so you can go ahead. There are still bugs, don't expect to not find bugs, but report them and we're going to try to fix them as soon as possible. So a new big one is the head of time compilation. We were almost there last year, but now it's, uh, it's really stable. Been using it for a lot of projects. Uh, and I want to show you how that works and why it's a big deal. So I'm just gonna take the first example of my book, which is just a simple Halo World example. And this is the Ruby file. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the code with you. I just want to show you how that works and um, show you the, the end result. So, I have this Ruby file, which is a Ruby file, you press on it, and it, it changes the button to say hello world, and then there's a voice using the Mac voice that will say hello world. Uh, very Something very simple, just to understand the different concepts. Um, and the way you will compile it is by just calling the compiler on the file and say you want a, uh, a macro file or macho file, and call it demo. And we're verifying that the file is a, is a proper executable file, everything works fine, and we can call it directly. And the end result is that. So let me actually show you the code so you believe me it works. Um, so I need to switch to mirroring. All right. So we have here in have a folder. I already just run the command quickly. So we have the demo file. And I'm just going to open the demo file and verify the sound works. And that starts the application. Here is our small application here. And I will press the button. And Hello, Ruby. Uh, there you go. You have the most useful application ever. Um, so, this is just a few lines of code, but I was able to compile it. And uh, you have the file uh, right there. And I can just show you. It's just not lying to you. There you go. Back to the presentation. <coughs> So what you can also do, which is interesting with the compiler, is you can take a bunch of files and create 
a shared library that you can reuse. So if you have a bunch of Ruby files, you can put them together, and then when you compile another file that has dependency on them, you can actually reuse this shared library, so you get these dynamic libraries. Um, it's something pretty practical when you, you end up sharing code between different projects. The new other feature we have is a debugger, uh, which if you ever use MacRuby at the beginning, you would know it was pretty painful and not having a debugger was a big challenge. So here's a small uh, silent detector, so uh, for people who don't know, don't understand reference, well that's too bad for you. Uh, we have a bunch of characters from a very famous sci-fi TV show, um, and we um, have this crappy detector that I wrote because I might be asylum, and we have a silent question mark uh, method, and it would always return false. So when we run the code, uh, what will happen is that now everybody will be seen as not asylum. When, if you watch the show, you know that six is actually asylum, and if you haven't watched the show, I'm sorry, now you know six is not asylum. Uh, <laughs> so we have a bug in our code, very simple bug. So what we can do is we can call the debugger, and the way that works is you just say Mac Ruby D, you put the, the name of the file, and it starts a debugger, it goes into the first line, and you get a command line. And what you do is you add a breakpoint, and you say B, which is intro the breakpoint, in the file silent detector.rb, line 8, and I will actually add a condition. I only want to break on the breakpoint if the character um, a variable is equal to 6. So once we do that, we just say, okay, continue, run the program. The program goes until it finds uh, the condition, stops at the condition, gives me the prompt, and I can verify by printing uh, and evaluating the value of character, and it tells me, okay, it's six. So we are at the right place where we want it to be. Uh, we call the method on it, silent question mark character, and we see it's false. Well, we know that's where the bug is, so we just confirm the bug. So to fix it, we can actually, at runtime, uh, rewrite the method and say dev style and character, and now we say basically we're not really fixing it, we're just pretending that if it's six, we know it's a style and everybody else is not a style. So there you go, we, do, we just did live bug fixing, and we can keep on running the code, and now it finds that six is a style. There you go. So that was a debugger. Um, the other big thing, and uh, this is a bit of a complex topic, so I'll try to make it as simple as I can. But in Snow Leopard, Apple released uh, something called Grand Central Dispatch, which is built on top of Lib Dispatch. Um, and Lib Dispatch is, uh, is uh, an open source library at this point, and it's been ported to BSD, and I think other distributions are looking into it. And let me explain a bit more about it. The problem is trying to solve is that when you have to program with threads, it can be somewhat complicated. So I hear people telling me, oh, threads, it's awful, it's so hard, and nobody can do it now. It's not that bad. I mean, let's be honest, it's not that bad, but it can be challenging. And uh, especially when you write desktop applications, you cannot have any blocking operations, because if you block your main run loop, you get you know, this pizza of death on the Mac that's been like that. And that's because something has been blocked. Um, the other issue with threads is that you as a developer have to deal with it. And the system can get overwhelmed if he has too many threads. You need to know exactly how many threads you need to run based on the system load, and that gets really challenging. So um, what happened is Mac, uh, Apple um, said, well, we're going to give a break to the developers, and we're going to let the kernel do all the work. So you're going to just pass a block and do the job. So in, in Ruby, um, currently, this is how it works. If you have a thread, um, the thread the thread gets locked, so every single thread will be locked and cannot talk to the same data at the same time. Um, so the, the problem with this is that it can be slow. So if you have multiple threads, you have to wait until they all get scheduled. The, big, um, the other big issue is that to get full concurrency, uh, the only way to really do that is to have multiple processes. And even though that works, I don't think it's a very elegant solution to have to run multiple processes to get, to get full concurrency and use all the cores on the machine. Uh, the big advantage though is that you get data integrity because now you cannot have two threads talking to the same data at the same time and you cannot corrupt data. So that's actually a big advantage, especially when we talk about um, C extensions that could potentially not be uh, thread safe. But if you remember what I said earlier, MacRuby doesn't have a global VM lock. So what that means uh, is that the way we work is every single thread runs inside its own VM, 
which is uh, lock less enemy entrance and talk to the core. The problem we're having um, is that even though it's really nice, so you really don't get the concurrency, you still have to deal with threat. And threat is still a pain in the butt. So, lib dispatch, that's the library I told you about that Apple wrote to handle these this use cases. Um, this is the small wrapper we have around um, lib dispatch, and you can require a dispatch, and you can create what we call a job. And the job is not like a thread, you need to see it as as a job. I'm sorry, it's hard to explain, but just to pretend you understand what I'm saying and it would be good. So you create a, a job, and you don't really know what it is, but it's a job. So imagine you have this job, and you give it a block, and you say, okay, go and execute this block. And then you call your, your job, and you say, okay, give me the value, give me the result of uh, the block. In this case, uh, what happens is that it's going to block and wait for the results. So the rest of the code cannot execute. It's a, it's a very synchronous way of approaching um, the, the, the job. It's interesting, but it's not very valuable. Um, what's more interesting is to use this different approach, which will use a block, and whenever the job is done with the job you gave it to, um, it will dispatch the, the block and execute it asynchronously. So now that becomes more interesting because you can do an IO call, for instance, where you can do a very slow operation and just have a block that will take care of the result whenever it's available. But wait, there's actually more to that. What you can do uh, is you can create your job and you can actually send a bunch of blocks to it, a bunch of operations to it. And you just send as many as you want. And that's where um, lib dispatch is really interesting because you don't really know how many threads you need to run this code. You might need three threads, but maybe your system is overwhelmed. You, you, can only, you should only use one thread. And lib dispatch will do it itself for you. You don't need to deal with that. You don't need to know how many threads are, are used. You don't need to do any of that. You just send the blocks and you get the returns back. So here what we do is we send three operations, uh, then we join the block, which, uh, which we join the job, which would just wait until everybody is done, and then you have access to uh, all the results for the, the, the operations. So it's a nice uh, wrapper API around leap dispatch. Um, there's also another way of approaching it, is because every single enumerable in Ruby could be dispatched in parallel if you want to. So we added a small extension where you can say, do a each or whatever enumerable uh, 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 method you have and do it in parallel for me. So now if you have to, to calculate this, uh, we need to find a pair for a, a gig. Now if you have 150 gigs, you don't want to start 150 threads. And lead dispatch will take care of that for you. So you have time and uh, we have most of the enumerable um, methods that are available uh, to run in parallel. So the only problem is, if you remember again, I was telling you that MacRuby doesn't have a global VM lock. So what does it mean? It means that you could potentially corrupt your data if you're not careful. And this is where there's a new, another feature of lib dispatch, which is instead of using the concurrent queues, which is the default, you can use serial queues. And serial queues are lock through synchronization. And what they allow you to do is to create, um, to use the, the actor uh, paradigm and create a hash. In this case, we create a proxy object and we say in our job we have a synchronized object called, which is a hash, uh, which is called, called scores. And for every single of our user, we're going to create a new job that we're going to send. Uh, well, we're actually going to create a new block that we're going to send to the job and we're going to do some calculation and we're going to modify our um, hash. And the way that works is you get now a, a lock, well, it's not a lock, it's actually a queue at the proxy object level. So you don't get any lock, and everybody will go and modify the object in a very safe way. And at the end, you can actually um, get your object, the proxy object, and look at it and introspect it and do uh, what you need to do on it. So now we're getting a nice, safe proxy object. Uh, and uh, when you work on desktops, you actually want to use all the cores in the machine and you might want to do some complicated um, desktop processing. And uh, using lib dispatch again and using uh, the nice wrapper we have, uh, you can make these things much easier than usual. The other new feature we have is Control Tower. And Control Tower uh, is a web server that we announced last year, but it was not released and we had to go through the entire Apple process before it gets released, which takes forever. Um, and it's a simple web server for Rack Apps, which uses GCD. 
Um, so you can actually embed that in your app if you want to serve requests from your app or if you want to run a, a server on a Mac Mini, why not? Um, what's interesting with this concept, first it was a nice proof of concept for GCD we were able to show how uh, a simple uh, web server can be written in Ruby using GCD. And the other aspect of it is for people who want to embed and do peer-to-peer -peer, uh, or just serve web application locally on the network or um, features like that. It's a gem and you can actually go to GitHub and download it and look at the source code and even just learn how GCD is using this code. The other aspect is we have a new dispatcher. Um, it's just safer and uses a, a cache. <laughs> well, whatever, it's not really important. Basically, we, we clean up the internal. We also have to switch from Onikuruma to ICU. And the reason why we did that is because Onikuruma is not thread safe. Uh, and because we are thread safe, it was causing some issues um, for the problem I explained earlier. So we had to switch to ICU. Uh, there's no difference for the end user, just to let you know. Uh, we also worked on, uh, we rewrote some of the classes, a string and hash where we return uh, to get more solid foundation, get better performance. We have now support for seed blocks. So that's something uh, pretty interesting. If you've used um, Objective-C and Coco, a lot of, uh, the, since no labor, a lot of different APIs require you to use uh, a C block. And it basically looks like Ruby. You just pass the block and the block gets used. Uh, until recently, we were not supporting that. Now you can just use the same method as you would do in Coco and use the Ruby block and everything works fine. Uh, this feature actually requires an update to bridge support. Uh, bridge which report yet, yes. Um, another new feature is sandboxing. And I believe, Aaron, Aaron, are you here? <coughs> no, tender load? No. I believe Aaron pointed that to other Rubies. Um, but the way it works is you can sandbox your application. And uh, it uses the an OS 10 feature, which allows you to uh, block uh, access to some uh, underlying features. So in this example here, uh, we create a sandbox and uh, we put our application and we say that the application cannot use internet. And then we try to use OpenURI to access the MacRuby website. And when we do that, it will raise an exception telling us that connect is not allowed. By default, you have five um, profiles. So you can make your application a bit safer, which is really good for your, your end users. So if you don't need to write to this, for instance, you can block that or you can allow to only write to temporary uh, files. Uh, you can block from the network and you can you have a lot of cool features. Um, you might not care too too much about that right now, but as people are gonna use your application and you want to make them safer and prove that to them, it might be a nice feature to use. The next big thing, and it's not really Mac would be specific, is the new Mac Apple Store. And uh, the Mac uh, App Store uh, is actually very interesting because it allows you to have great exposure. And Exposure for developers is a big deal, especially if you work on a desktop uh, environment. If you try to write a desktop app and you try to sell your app, it's really, really challenging because you need to have people to know about you. And they need to go on your website and, and try to pay with PayPal and there might be someone else. And I mean, it gets really complicated. What the App Store uh, really proved uh, with the iPhone is that people love the user experience and they really want to go and find application. And what you want is users find your application. So to improve the, the, the user experience and to make yourself more available, you can use the App Store. And um, MacRuby uh, can be used for that. You can compile your application so nobody sees your source code. You can submit already your application. And whenever it's available, people will be able to find it, review it, click <coughs> on it. Uh, and it's especially, especially interesting for people, and I think most people here have been working on web apps. And they're like, well, I spent a lot of time and money on the web app. I'm not going to rewrite all my app uh, for the desktop. And this is where uh, you need to think different, and you need to actually reinvent the desktop application experience. There's no reason why you cannot use WebKit within your application and some native controls and mix things together. So even though your website, yes, is available, uh, on online, people can go there. Now they can have a button on the desktop, they can click on it, they can do backups, they can get notifications. There are a lot of cool features you can do. So I'm going to show you an example of uh, WebKit later on once we switch to the, the example for our desktop. Actually, we're there already. So what can we do with MacRuby? <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
Um, the first thing is I realize a lot of people don't know about that, but when you install MacRuby, and actually even if you don't install MacRuby, if you install Xcode, you will find a bunch of examples on your computer. Uh, and with MacRuby, we have a new folder. So if you go on your Mac and you start, type slash developer slash example slash Ruby, you have a bunch of Ruby examples, and slash MacRuby will give you more MacRuby specific examples. And we have a bunch of apps you can compile, and we have a bunch of scripts. So what can you do with MacRuby? All right, first demo, I need a volunteer. Me. Yeah, Rich, can you come here? Yes. Thank you, Rich. Rich Kilmer, everybody, thank you. I have it on the microphone. That's good, I actually, I need that. Oh, cool. <laughs> Carry microphones around. <laughs> So speech recognizer, um, this is a very simple example. All the examples were written in less than an hour. They're really quick and dirty. Um, did that work well? Okay, so uh, what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to find the application. So I already compiled the app, um, so we can just, we don't have to waste time on that. I'm starting the application. It's a very simple application. I'll show you the code in a, in a minute. Uh, it uses the, the voice recognizer. So um, on screen, you can see the different comments. We have a bunch of names of uh, Rubies, and I'm gonna ask Chad if you can use the, oh, um, sorry, Rich. Rich? We're all the same. To <laughs> use the comment, so you will say show and the name of the person in the list, and if things work properly, we should see a picture of the person you're calling. Do I have to say with a French accent? Or? I'm not sure, <laughs> you, you, you try to. Show work. Chad. Show Chad. Plug it in. Oh, I, I, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Show Chad. No, hold on. Show Chad. Show Chad. <laughs> As you can see, it's working very well. Please. Show Chad. This is really disturbing. <laughs> okay, well, maybe, well, maybe it's the name. Hold on. Chad, stand up. <clears throat> yeah, just show yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Show Samson Nitty. Show Samson Nitty. Okay, we're gonna notice. Show Chad. Show Chad. Show Hampton. Just Chad doesn't work. Okay, good. Chad isn't compatible with Show Max. Show Max. Show Max. Okay, good. <laughs> I want to make sure that works. Okay. <laughs> Show Aaron. Show Aaron. Okay, Show Aaron. It's okay. I think you're a French accent. Let me try directly. Okay. okay. <laughs> Show Aaron. There you go. <laughs> yeah, it's a French accent. <laughs> Show Leah. Show Leah. There you go. Nice. Show Rich. Show Rich. Perfect. <laughs> awesome. All right. Oh, cool. There might be some bugs in the application. <laughs> it looks like we found a vertical orientation there. So, well, it doesn't seem to work. I think it's because of the noise. It worked very well at home when I was alone. But, um, and here we can also switch photos. I had backed up in case it was not working. So, actually, we have a photo of chat I'm going to show you right now. There you go. Um, so, for this application, uh, just to show you how hard it was, uh, let me just open the source code. Do I actually have time to show you the source code? Uh, yeah, all right, I'll show you the source code. It will be available online. Um, so let me open this, this file. There you go. So this is to create a menu. It doesn't really matter. So the only thing that we do is when the application, so the way Coco works is you have these callbacks. So when things happen, it will call the method if it's defined. In this case, um, when the application is done uh, launching, it will send a notification, and this is when I create a menu, I set up the recognizer, and I create the menu, and I put the page in front. Uh, to set up the recognizer, I just needed to say, okay, speech recognizer. Like What's that? Bigger? bigger. Oh, bigger, sorry, yes. <laughs> I'm looking on my screen, and it looks great, but. <laughs> uh, where was I? Here. Is it big enough? Maybe a bit more? So I'm just setting the NS speech recognizer, which is a framework uh, from, from Coco, and I set a bunch of comments. Here I just have the names of everybody, and I put a delegate, so whenever the comment is triggered, it will call itself. 
uh, and I started listening. And then the callback here is called speech recognizer, and I would get the comment that was sent, and then I can call my method here called show portrait, and the show portrait here just gets the image based on the name of the comment and display it on the screen. Uh, I implemented the data at home, I have a Mac Mini on my TV and I just say open Skype and open Plex and you know do stuff and it's very simple to do and I end up yelling in my TV because it cannot recognize my accent and we all have fun and we, actually we give up using it, I, my wife got tired of that. So my, <laughs> it's still very cool and you should really use it every day. Um, so that was the first demo, let's look at the second demo we have, core location. Um, so a lot of people don't realize that, but on the Mac, you actually have core location. You don't need to have an iPhone. Uh, and I asked on Twitter and asked like, people, what do you want me to do with core location for the demo for, for RubyConf? And people told me, oh, why don't you use Gowala? I actually don't use Gowala, but um, I looked at the API and it looked pretty simple. Uh, did I compile it? No, I'll just compile it in front of you. So um, before that, I show you the code. The only thing you do is when you initialize the class, um, I create a new object which is an instance of a CL location manager, and I create a callback, a callback that will be called whenever that happens. And I, I start my location manager and I stop it once once I receive the the callback. So let me compile the application. Uh, it's very very poorly written code because I didn't use the dispatch. So the first thing happening is that uh, the application will ask you, are you okay to share with others uh, your location? Uh, in this case, I will say okay. Uh, and what will happen is that, oh, there's a scratch on me. Yay. Oh, I'm not online, that's why. Okay, so let me turn on. I should have thought about that. I should also really rescue the error. You don't want to see that in, in a real app. So we should be back online. Let's try. Oh, you got video? Oh, I was just... So the app restarts, you want to share, I say yes. There you go, so it found my location here. Uh, it sees where I'm at, and it found this video in case I was moving. And in the background, it found all the different Gowala location around me. Uh, and I can see there's a bunch of people that checked in here, and 65 checked in for 50 users. Uh, so I can just click on it, and it will open in the browser. Um, Eventually, oh, you should go to the page. Uh, very simple application. Uh, there was just a few lines of code. If the internet is fast enough, we'll be able to see the location. There you go. So, um, to show you the code, I'm not going to go into any details, but um, you just need to read the documentation to see how this works. And I have a small controller here. And what I do is I say, when the application is done uh, launching, you start the location manager, and I pass a block, and the block will basically find the different spots and put them in the table. And the table, um, I added a few methods, so when you click on it, it goes to the URL that we got from the JSON. So we just par parse the JSON response. Uh, and that was it, so you can use core location, and uh, you can let your user uh, use stuff from the web and using their location. Next example, address book. I'm not gonna run this one, I'm just gonna show it to you because it takes a little while because of the internet. Uh, I wrote a small application which uh, lets me find all my followers on Twitter and put them in my address book. So there's this, uh, this, this button here, it's totally useless, I agree. Um, but I click on this button and it goes and, and calls the, the Twitter API and finds all the people, create a Twitter group, because I don't want to follow with my real contacts and put all the information of the people so I can find them. And if you open my address book, you can see I have this Twitter account uh, and you can see all the people were parsed and they were added. I have their, their photo, their link, and their description. So now if I'm looking uh, for Aaron, for instance, I should be able to find him. There you go, I get all these details. Um, and that was very simple to do. So you have integration with iTunes, with address book, with most applications, the calendar, uh, most applications on the Mac, you can actually call them directly from Mac Ruby um, and interact with them. So it allows you to do a lot of interesting things. Close that. Yeah. All right, what's the next one? String tokenizer. Okay, this one I actually don't. I will just show it to you. This is just a small example to show you how you can call and use C functions that are available from the OS. 
Um, in foundation, you have a lot of different um, calls that are available in C classes. And here in this case, what I do is I, I reopen the string class and I define a new method called language. And I call this long uh, function, C <coughs> method function. And I pass it the string itself and I create a range uh, that will start at zero and go all the way at the end of the string. And when I call this function, it returns a string, and I can see automatically the, the language being used. So here we have an array of uh, strings in different languages. Do you guys recognize the languages? What's the first one? French. 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 Second one? English. English. Wow, good. Uh, third one? <laughs> I heard a different thing. That's like well, we'll see. You. Apple will tell us in a second. Next one? Italian. Italian. The one after? Arabic. Arabic, and the last one? Japanese. Japanese. Good, let's see if um, my activity agrees with you. And the result when you run the code is actually French, English, Spanish, Italian, Arabic, and Japanese. You can see that Arabic is at the beginning of the sentence of the string because it's right to left, not left to right. So uh, if you start digging into the Cocoa API and all the functions given by uh, foundation and everything else, you actually end up with a lot of cool features of stuff you cannot do on the web right now that you can have on the desktop app and you can actually mix the web app with the, uh, the desktop uh, features. So the last demo, I'm actually a bit worried about this demo because it's a bit complicated, but uh, I wanted to show you something cool because I realized if you want to be, if you want to give a good talk, you need to show something different. And I gave myself a challenge. I tried to um, use a, a PS3 controller Look it through Mac Ruby uh, and use WebKit to display uh, a canvas and using JavaScript and Mac Ruby and my controller to change uh, the display. So hopefully things are going to work. It's just a simple script, but you never know. So I'm um, just going to start it. Mac Ruby demo. So it should try to connect. Oh, I should have verified first. If, yep, we're con connected. So I found my PS3 controller. And you can see now on screen, actually the two thumbs, woohoo, it's working good. <laughs> so I'm moving the thumb, and actually I can press the thumb buttons, and it works. And you can see on the left and the right the location of these, uh, these buttons. And I can use right here the PlayStation buttons and move them up and down, and you can see the marks on the bottom, I press the bottom left, <coughs> and change the button, and all the buttons are mapped. Uh, and I can even, I, so you can imagine what you can do by controlling the browser. So I'll show you quickly the code. It's just HTML and JavaScript for the view. Uh, and uh, Mac Ruby is taking care of all the, the Bluetooth, Bluetooth information and sends messages through WebKit. And WebKit takes this information and sends JavaScript to, uh, to the display and moves all the objects. Um, so let me quit by pressing start, and yeah, I think we're fine. Actually, it's great. <laughs> so let's look at the source code. Um, it's not a product, it's not done in Xcode, I just did that um, here, so we have the file. Um, what I had to do, for that to work, is I had to use what we call, uh, I had to create a framework for the PS3 controller. So I took the drivers, and I wrapped them in Objective-C. Uh, actually, there was already a wrapper, so I didn't have to do anything. But um, the reason why uh, was done like that is so the API is just easier to use and having to do C functions everywhere. Uh, then I require uh, the framework, the WebKit framework, and I create this delegate that creates a new PS3 controller, and the delegate itself, so it will basically send the, the callbacks directly to itself. I wrapped a little bit the JavaScript evaluation script, so from a Mac Ruby, you can talk directly to WebKit and you can send object or methods um, to execute code in the, the, the browser. Um, so you basically get a callback when the connection is, re is received uh, when the player connects and then when you press the triangle button, you can do that. And I'm sending, I do the GFJS call and then I implemented the logic in um, my JS file and the view is simple view. Uh, which uses Rappel.js and jQuery, and I have a bit of CSS, and that's about it. So, a very simple uh, example showing the, the power of uh, 
of microbe through hardware and uh, software. So there you go for the, the demo. Uh, you can get more information. You can go to macrobe.org. Uh, you can actually download right now the, the latest version, which is 071, or you can take the nightly. You just need to double click. Uh, that will install Macrobe. There will be no conflict with the current Ruby that's on the machine. You can also use RVM if you prefer. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, if you want to share with me what you've been working on, the different examples, if you have questions about the, the App Store uh, or anything like that, you can contact me uh, via all this, uh, this mix. I think I left about five minutes for questions. Uh, so let's go ahead and answer questions. So what are we going to say this on the uh, app on? So again, when are we going to say this on the app? So the question is, um, it was a really great presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> So okay, so the question is when are we going to see Mac Ruby on the iPhone? Um, I cannot talk for Apple. Technically, there's no reason why you cannot do it. Uh, we uh, we basically need Apple to um, finish doing it, or we need somebody else to do it. Uh, technically, there's no reason why it could not happen. So I don't really have an answer of when. Maybe, maybe not soon. Uh, you know, it's it's. it's so what about garbage collection? Um, so there's no garbage collector on the iPhone, which is the main reason why Mac Ruby currently doesn't work on it. There is no reason why you cannot add a garbage collector in your, in, in your framework. So that's not really a problem. You can also have uh, Mac Ruby doing release and retain um, in it. So technically, that's not really a challenge. So, so are you saying that, are you saying that Absolutely, yes. Uh, Macrobe is fully open source. You have access to all the... Can we show that do it? So <laughs> the, the question first was, uh, uh, can, you, can anybody go in the source code, modify it, and make it work on the iPhone? Uh, and Dr. Nick was asking, can I show you how to do it? Sure, let me just show you right now. Um, yeah, so you're, you're totally able to do that. Um, it doesn't mean that Apple will let you submit your apps, but there's no reason why they would not at the same time. So. Will they know? Uh, probably not, because it gets compiled, but... How long does it take to show it? How long does it take to show it? <laughs> uh, probably 15 minutes. Oh, I'll just do it now. I'll just do it now. <laughs> uh, but, but I mean, the, the real point, uh, to, to answer your question without answering it... <laughs> Sorry, Dave. Uh, I, th I think the main point of Macrobe is still to go on the desktop to be really fully improved on the desktop before we can move to the, to the iPhone and to the iOS and other platform. I don't know really what Apple wants to do with it, but um, we first need to get one other app. We need to be really solid with the desktop. Uh, we have the App Store right now. There's a lot of stuff we still need to iron out. We need to get feedback. We're at about 90% compatibility with the Ruby spec. We need to go up to 100. I mean, there are a lot of things that need to happen. I don't think the iPhone is the main target, to be honest. If, if you, uh focus on the iPhone first, you'll get more developers working on Mac. So that's not a question, but he was saying if you work on, it, <laughs> if you work on the iPhone, uh, you are more developers. Well, you're welcome to talk to Apple. <laughs> that was a question over there. Do you know if there are any plans to include it uh, as a framework in 10.7 or future releases? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm asked if I know uh, if the next version of the OS will include Mac Ruby. I cannot answer this question. I'm sorry, no comment. It depends what scripting language we use. With OSA. So, no, currently OSA is not supported. You have scripting bridge, which is how you can talk to iTunes. And on my blog, I have an example where in the morning I just basically play music and iTunes gets started by Mac Ruby and just play smooth music to wake me up and my baby. So, <laughs> I just, so you can talk to iTunes, but OSA, which is one another. A uh, way of talking to different uh, apps is currently not supported. It was supported, it was written by Laurent for Ruby itself. So I'm almost sure it's going to happen for Mac Ruby pretty soon. It's in the plan. It's in the plan, yeah. Yeah, two questions. Uh, why use uh, Mac Ruby over Objective C? Like, would you lose? Why well, use Mac Ruby instead of Objective C? You do whatever you want, my friend. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there is no specific reason. What I would tell you why I would I prefer Mac Ruby is because I think the syntax is nicer in Ruby. Uh, you can also use some of the, the libraries that already exist. Uh, you don't have to have a headers and an implementation file. Uh, Performance-wise, it's pretty close. 
Um, and you can actually mix and match. What I didn't show is that the MacRuby is a framework, so if you already have an Objective-C project, you can actually use the MacRuby framework and have some features written in Ruby, uh, running at the same time as the one in Objective-C, and you can actually talk in between each other. So if you like Objective-C and you're happy with it, I mean, don't use MacRuby. I mean, I'm not gonna force you, believe me. Have you heard of uh, new, and what do you think about it? What's the question? I've heard of new, and do I know what it is, and do I like it? I really like MacRuby. <laughs> question over there, Nick? No, I'm not going to show it to you, Nick. <laughs> What's that the question? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you can send an email to Steve Jobs and ask him if he can show you. You just said it's not for it. I did not say it's trivial, <laughs> you don't quote me properly here. I say it's doable to do. There's no reason why technically you cannot do it. There's a big difference between the two. <laughs> uh, so, isn't there a bird of a feather session on MacRuby, and are you going to be there, and maybe you could show it to him then? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, if there is no, we don't have a, a buff on MacRuby schedule. Uh, we can meet anywhere if you guys want to, yes? Someone just suggested a time on the mailing list. So six, when is it and what time is it? I'll be there. It was 1 p.m. tomorrow in the, the um, ballroom. 1 p.m. tomorrow in the ballroom. Okay. So yes, and I'll be there. Okay. And I cannot show you how that to compare for the iPhone. <laughs> isn't, isn't that right in the middle of like a, a session? Or is, is it over by then? I don't know. It's not over by then, but um, maybe they're planning to skip it. I mean, we can uh, we can talk on the thread, and you can find me if you have any questions. Go come and find me, and that'll be fine. One more question. Do we have time, Chad? Yeah. Okay. More questions? Yes. Uh, so I've been using MacRuby to test um, my Objective C code, but it's still pretty low level. Like it's not as nice as it could be. And I'm wondering if anyone is working on as a framework. Very good question. So the question is: This gentleman is using MacRuby to test code. Are you testing Objective C code or MacRuby code? Uh, Objective C. -Code. So he's testing Objective-C code with MacRuby, and he's asking me if there uh, there's plan for better testing. Ryan Davis is working, are you here, Ryan? No, not here. Ryan is actually uh, working on a mini test extension for MacRuby. Uh, he already has that working, but he wanted more feedback. He wants to get people to tell him exactly what, he, what what's needed. Uh, we also support Bacon, but we recommend you use mini test because that's what's coming with, with Ruby. Um, we also need to get more feedback because that's kind of a new area, like how do you test a desktop app with Objective-C. So uh, yes, there is a, a lot of interest. A lot of people actually are interested in using MacRuby to test Objective-C, which is probably what you're doing. Uh, and we still need to do some work in this area. Any other questions? Yes, Carlo. I'm not sure I understood your accent, uh, Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you repeat the question in French for me, please? Yeah. Uh, so, how do you recompile? You know, when you make changes to the source code? How do you recompile? So I didn't show it to you. I can really, really show it to you. So, so Dr. Nick will be happy. Um, <laughs> actually, he knows that already. So. Uh, when you're in, in uh, Xcode, you can choose different targets, and one of them is to compile, and the other one is to embed, so you can actually put Mac Ruby in your app. So the only thing you need to do is to repress the button, and it will create a compiled version. You can also use the command line if you want to, but um, if you look at the targets here underneath, it's a bit tiny, but uh, it's just calling a shell script. Um, it's, it's a bit tiny, I don't think I can make it much. Yeah, there you go. So it's basically just calling Mac, Mac Ruby deploy compile. Um, so it's really easy to recompile. In development, usually you don't compile, you stay in JIT until you come to a point where you like it, you compile it, and you can benchmark it. You can use new uh, the GDB debugger, and you can use DTrace to see what's going on in your app, and you can use the shipments. Any other questions? Yes. Are people writing uh, gems that are Mac Ruby specific? Is there a way to kind of segregate them from other gems? So the question is, uh, do people write uh, Mac Ruby specific gems, and how do you see this? How do you know the difference? So I personally did write some Mac Ruby specific uh, gems, and I need to talk with Eric about how to make Ruby gems. 
specific not to the platform you're on, but to the <coughs> Ruby you're on. Uh, what you can do is when you load the jam, you can say Ruby version, and, or you can check on the Ruby uh, itself. And if it's not Mac Ruby, you can raise an exception. Uh, people have been using Deployer and Isolate successfully in their app. Um, so I think there's just, we need to talk about Ruby gems, how to make it a bit more specific to the different Rubies that exist. I think that's it. Thank you very much.